Hi, Hi. Deepak. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us, and I apologize for that confusion. I know that can be frustrating. No can, can you see me clearly? <laughs> I can. I can. Okay, okay great. <laughs> well, thank you again. It's an honor to, to just have a conversation with such a luminary, for sure. And I did some introduction before you, you hopped on that, um, you know, you're the author of over 90 books. And I think Total Meditation is the 91st. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. That's correct. Gotcha. No, Okay, um, so since we, I'm just going to dive right in about this mm -hmm. book. Um, you know, we, we as, a, as a culture, are very familiar, I think, with meditation. We hear a lot about it. We hear a lot of, about the health benefit. Can I ask, um, you know, why you decided to write the book and if you could talk a little bit about that distinction between an isolated time of meditation and then having this total meditation? Well, if you actually go to the traditions of meditation in the world, East and West, but particularly Eastern wisdom traditions, the original goal of meditation was to get enlightened. Now, that's a mm -hmm. very complicated word, but what it meant was there's a process that helps you go beyond the mind. That means beyond your thoughts, beyond your imagination, beyond your emotions, beyond your perceptual activity of the world. Mm -hmm. And when you go beyond that, that is called transcending everything that we know as reality and getting in touch with just awareness. So awareness is the fundamental ground without which there's no experience. Without awareness, there's no perception, there's no thought, there's no imagination, there's no sensation, there's no image, there's no feeling, there's no sensation. So awareness is the ground of all experience. Right now, you and I are having an experience, this conversation, but so are many people in cyberspace right now. So mm -hmm. our minds are all entangled. Our minds are all entangled. Your mind is different than mine. And we can see all these comments. People are reacting differently. So minds are innumerable. Bodies are innumerable. Perceptions are innumerable. But awareness is one. The awareness is the ground out of which all experience emerges in the universe. And when you are settled into awareness, when you're resting in awareness, without any conceptualization, total stillness, you have access to everything, inspiration, intuition, higher consciousness, uh, you can say insight, imagination, creativity. But ultimately, um, what we call three very important experiences, which are part of every tradition, and they're at the root of every tradition, and they're at the root of every uh, religion too. And that's the following three experiences. Number one, finding your true identity beyond your provisional identity. So right now I'm speaking to your provisional identity. You started this life as a fertilized ovum, and you'll end it with death. So will I. In between, we'll have many bodies, many minds, many personalities. So there's mm -hmm. no such thing as a particular mind or a particular body or a particular universe even. It's all fluctuating, and it's fluctuating ceaselessly faster than the speed of light. When we have that experience of our true identity, then we slowly dismantle the ego identity, because that becomes our identity, which is absolute. So that's the first experience. The second experience, again, in meditative traditions, is what we call the emergence of Platonic values, named after Plato. Truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, empathy, equanimity. And the third experience, which is even more interesting, is that you lose the fear of death because you realize mm. that awareness is not subject to death. Its, it's activities, of course, are born and die every moment. Like mm -hmm. This thought is born, it dies as soon as it's born. This perception is there, it's born. Then I look here, that one is dead. I look at my body, that's a snapshot, and I look at it again, that's another snapshot. It looks like the previous snapshot, but if you compare the snapshots over 10 years, they're all changing. You know, so right. you take a selfie now, you take a selfie from 10 years ago, 10 <laughs> years ahead. Which one is the real you? None of them. 
the only real you is immeasurable, irreducible, without cause, with not spaceless, timeless, eternal, not subject to birth, not subject to death, and living in joy all the time. That's the goal of total meditation. Wow. It's so interesting to me, just, li- just coming from obviously living in a Western culture where we, we attach so much to our success. We attach so much to our identities and we lead with them now. I mean, even being a writer, it used to be you just kind of hid behind your desk and now your face is everywhere and you're so public facing. So h- how do we balance um, that sort of um, effort to kind of ha- almost have like an ego dissolution to, uh, with like our day-to-day lives and what we have to, to do just to earn an income. So I don't think we're talking about ego dissolution. If you had ego dissolution, you wouldn't have a body. The body's image is the body is the image of the ego identity. Uh-huh. And so is what you're perceiving at the, uh, at the world. If you had ego dissolution, you would be disembodied. So we're not mm-hmm. talking about ego dissolution. We're talking about ego taking a back seat. That's all. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, if you say, look at any wisdom tradition, let's take the Buddhist tradition because it's so popular and mindfulness now is the word. So the four, four noble truths, number one, there is suffering. Not He didn't mm-hmm. say life is suffering. He said there is suffering. Mm-hmm. just like there is joy, okay? But there is suffering, number one. Number two, there are causes for suffering, which include ego identity, grasping what can't be grasped because it's ephemeral, transient, fluctuating, recoiling the same thing, it's transient, so that's a cause of suffering. You keep grasping and recoiling. The fourth is identifying with the ego. The fifth is the fear of death. So that's it. There, everywhere, Mm -hmm. when ego takes a front seat. Ego takes a back seat, suddenly opens the door to abundance, suddenly opens the door to creativity and infinite uh, synchronicity, joy, and everything changes. I mean, let me give you a metaphor. You know, there's a frog that lives in a well, and one day there's a big storm and a frog that was in the ocean happens to land in the puddle. And, you know, Mm. the little frog in the puddle, he wants to show off. He says, see how big my puddle is. He goes from one end of the puddle to the other end, (laughs) this end of the puddle to that end. And the other frog can't even tell this little frog that I come from the ocean. You don't don't know what's there. So people Mm. are so afraid of losing their ego identity because that's who they think they are, not knowing (laughs) that when it takes a backseat, there's the ocean and not the puddle. Yeah, it's such a, it's a, that's a great analogy. And of course, in, in the book and, you know, and just when we hear about meditation in general, um, we're often talking about quieting our thoughts or getting rid of them altogether. I mean, I don't know how possible that is. You talk about that in your book, but um, you kind of hint at the fact that I don't know that it's fair to say that we're addicted to our thoughts, but we certainly are attached to them. And I'm wondering, especially being a physician, if you can talk a little bit about sort of the um, bursts of even endorphins we might get in our brain from these thoughts, right? If they're negative, if they make us outraged, if they make us sad, it's charging us up still. So going into the state of sort of empty, not emptiness, but stillness and peace, is it like a come down, do you think, a little bit, or we're afraid of it? It's just not, hasn't been a part of the culture. And so it seems strange and alien. But now suddenly, because, you know, there's pandemic, there's global crisis, there's climate change, there's war, there's terrorism, there's racism, there's bigotry, there's hatred, there's prejudice, there is extinction of species, there are tornadoes and whatever in, in Texas and glaciers melting in the Himalayas suddenly people are panicking and saying, what the heck is going on? And you know what is going on? This is the projection of our collective ego. The experiment, Mm. the human experiment brought to us through science and technology has been divine. We are talking to each other right now. We're talking to the rest world, but it's also been diabolical. The next extinction, if it happens, will be because of thought. Thought is the collective Mm -hmm collective stress that we're experiencing right now. So again, if you go to um, 
wisdom tradition. Say, what is thought? What is thought? You close your eyes and these thoughts come. When you say, oh, I'm going to shut them off, that's also a thought. So fighting a thought is also a thought. You can't do it. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. okay, to get rid of a thought is a thought. Okay? Yeah. So what is thought? Now, if you really actually go into meditation, you'll realize that every thought is more or less a memory or a desire. That's it. So uh, every thought you have, doesn't matter what it's disturbing, good, bad, or whatever, it's triggered by memory. And then it also frequently leads to a desire. I go to Starbucks, maybe I have a cup of coffee. <laughs> now I have memory. Okay, I have memory, that's coffee. That may lead to desire. If I like the taste, I'll go again and buy another cup of coffee. Or I might not like it, in which case I'll say, okay, I'll have tea next time. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about what wisdom traditions call karma. Karma mm. is every experience in the past that triggers a memory which triggers a desire. Now, if the experience was unpleasant, then you feel stress. If the, uh, uh, if the experience was pleasant, you feel happy. But you don't realize that just the fact that you feel happy is based on the fact that there is also unhappiness. Just the fact that you feel pleasure is also pain. You can't have one without the other. So mm -hmm. what is this body? This is the projection of karma, which is your internal dialogue which is based on past experiences and choices we made, either consciously or unconsciously. It doesn't matter. We, we made those choices, okay? Some of them were conscious. Some of them are unconscious. We made those choices. They trigger happy memories and unhappy memories. We mm -hmm. attach ourselves to one or the other and fear. With the happy memory, I want to attach it so I don't have the unhappy. But in fact, one is only possible because of the other. What is meditation? Mm -hmm. Meditation says, I'm not going to fight this. I'm just going to watch this. Okay, that's how meditation began. So the Buddha was actually sitting under the tree and he's observing his breath. And so what, what did he find out? First, he found out that just watching the breath, it slowed down. Why? Because the breath mirrors the movement of thought. You know, we are born with a breath. We t karma brings us to this world with a breath. And karma allows us to leave this world with a breath. So here's the Buddha. He's watching his breath, and he suddenly has this insight. Breath is a sensation. You know, how do you know you're breathing? It's a sensation. You're watching it, and then what is the second insight? He realizes it arises, it's experience, it falls. So his first conclusion is whatever arises is experience, but it also falls. And then okay. he said, if I hold on to this breath, I'll suffocate. So then what did he think? He said, that's the nature of all experience. It arises, it's experience, it falls. It's all experience is a sensation. Visual experience, tactile experience, taste experience, smell experience, relationship experience, experience of the Milky Way galaxy, experience of anything, it arises, it's experience, it falls. And all he does is watch it. It slows down, and then he goes to the source, which is who's watching? What is watching? What is watching a thought cannot be a thought. What is watching an emotion cannot be an emotion. What is watching this body cannot be the body. What is watching this iPhone cannot be uh, the iPhone. So who or what is watching, you try and figure that out, you give up, because every time you figure it out, that's a thought. So it couldn't be the watcher. Okay. Who's the watcher of the thoughts? That is the key. Once you find out who the watcher is, you find out the watcher is infinite, number one, infinite possibility. It's you without your conditioned mind. You are an infinite being having a finite experience. Second thing that happens is because you're connected to all that exists, you start experiencing synchronicity, meaningful coincidences. Religious traditions call that the state of grace. If you are, of course, very devout, Christian or Muslim or Hindu, you say, that's God. Okay, it doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, religious tradition also call it grace. Now, atheists call it good luck. Okay, 
some people say I was in the right place at the right time. Other people say I will, you know, just happened. Too many coincidences. I don't know what happened, but I felt I was taken care of. Why is all this happening? Because that consciousness, which is the ground of all experience, is connecting everything to everything in the entire universe. If you want another amazing video highlighting excellence in the Indian community, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.